on behalf of both organizations, which are co-sponsors for today's event, I want to thank everyone in the audience for attending. Um, I, I know we're going to have a good discussion. Um, a couple things to note about our co-sponsors. So the International National Security Law Practice Group at the Federal Society is made up of lawyers uh, that are focused on legal and policy issues uh, related to international and national security topics. Today's event is an example of the kind of programming we do throughout the year. If you're interested in our work, uh, I would encourage you to go to fedsoc.org where you can find more information. The National Security Institute is dedicated to finding practical answers to national security law and policy questions. It strives to provide balance to the public discourse on the most difficult national security challenges facing the United States and its allies. Um, NSI also conducts pro pro programming like this throughout the year, and you can learn more about its work at nationalsecurity.gmu.edu, or you can pick up one of the blue folders on the table out front if you're interested in learning more about what we're doing at NSI. Uh, before we get into our first panel, I want to make a few thank yous. First, I want to thank Jones Day for hosting us uh, and, and their kind hospitality. I also want to thank a couple of individuals, in particular Jim Dunlop and Dana Clabbers at Jones Day, uh, Dean Reuter and Erica Munkwitz at the Federalist Society, uh, and Jessica Jones, Jessica Marino, and Grant Haver at NSI. And just to remind everyone, the plan for today is to have two panels. Uh, the first will focus on the legal issues uh, the United States faces in connection uh, with its uh, presence in Syria. And the second will focus on the policy issues related to uh, US uh, presence in Syria. Uh, each panel will run for approximately 60 minutes. We'll have a break in between the two panels while we change over. And uh, at the end of the two panels, we'll have a reception, which you're all welcome to attend. So with that, I'm going to uh, switch hats and become the moderator for the first panel. So I'm delighted to be joined by uh, three uh, experts uh, in the field of uh, national security law. And I'm gonna make uh, very brief uh, introductions of them because they're all incredibly accomplished. And as a result, they have extremely long bios. So if you wanna learn more about them, uh, I can point you uh, to the Federalist Society website uh, with the information about this event uh, or their uh, bios at their respective uh, institutions. So first, uh, in alphabetical order, Jennifer Daskal, is an associate professor of law at American University, uh, Washington College of Law, where she teaches and writes in the fields of criminal national security and constitutional law. From 2009 to 2011, uh, Jen was counsel to the assistant attorney general for the national security, for, for national security at the Department of Justice. Prior to DOJ, uh, Jen was the senior counterterrorism counsel at Human Rights Watch, and she worked as a staff attorney for the Public Defender Service for the District of Columbia and she clerked for the Honorable uh, Jed S. Rakoff. She also spent two years as a National Security Law Fellow and Adjunct Professor at the Georgetown Law Center. From 2016 to 2017, she was an Open Society Institute Fellow working on issues related to privacy and law enforcement, access to data across borders. She's also the executive editor and a regular contributor to the Just Security blog. Charles Dunlop joined the Duke Law Faculty in 2010, where he is a professor of practice of law and the executive director on the Center on Law, Ethics, and National Security. His teaching and scholarly work focuses on national security, law of armed conflict, the use of force under international law, civil military relations, cyber war, air power, military justice, and ethical issues related to the practice of national security law. Uh, Professor Dunlop retired from the Air Force in June 2010, having attained the rank of Major General during a 34-year career in the Judge Advocate General Corps for the Air Force. In that capacity, uh, he assisted the Judge Ad Advocate General in the professional supervision of more than 2,200 judge advocates, 30, 350 civilian lawyers, 1,400 enlisted paralegals, and 500 civilians around the world. He's a prolific author and an accomplished public speaker. Uh, his commentary 
uh, ranges across a wide variety of national security topics, and he's published in the leading journals and newspapers. Uh, interestingly, for purposes of this event, is his 2001 essay written for Harvard University's Carr Center on the term lawfare. I don't know if he created the term lawfare, but he certainly has popularized it, and it's uh, a term that's on the tongue of uh, most people that pay attention to law and national security topics. Well, there's a reason I trademarked my blog. <laughs> <laughs> Our third speaker is Professor, Pro Professor Jeremy Rapkin, who's a professor of law at George Mason University's Scalia Law School, where he teaches international law and foreign relations law. Before joining the faculty in 2007, he was for over two decades a professor in the Department of Government at Cornell University. Professor Rapkin serves on the board of directors of the U.S. Institute of Peace, and he's in his second term there. Professor Rapkin's most recent book uh, with John Yu is Striking Power, How Cyber Robots and Space Weapons Change the Rules of War. And his earlier books include Law Without Nations and The Case for Sovereignty. I assume all are available at amazon.com. It's an opportunity there. Uh, his articles have appeared in major law reviews and political science journals and his journalistic contributions uh, in a range of magazines and newspapers, including the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, uh, the LA Times, and the online site Lawfare. So um, to set up the discussion today, I just wanna do sort of a brief uh, timeline to remind us all of sort of where we are at the current moment. Uh, following the 9-11 attacks uh, in 2001, uh, the Congress, uh, gave authorization for the use of military force uh, against al-Qaeda and its affiliates. And of course, wars in Afghanistan and Iraq followed. With regard to Syria, from 2011 to 2013, the CIA began providing non-lethal aid to certain groups of the Free Syrian Army. And in 2013, a formal program began led by the CIA for arming anti-Assad uh, forces. In August 2014, U.S. surveillance flights began over Syria. In September 2014, U.S. and coalition forces began airstrikes in Syria. In November, in November 2015, the Obama administration began deployment of U.S. special forces to Syria to assist the rebel forces fighting against the Islamic State. In 2017, regular U.S. forces arrived in Syria. In December 2019, President Trump announced the withdrawal or the planned withdrawal of all of 2,000 to 2,500 troops in Syria. That plan has been subsequently modified and the withdrawal has been slowed. And according to recent reports, there are current, there should be as of mid-May around 1,000 troops that will remain in place. So that's where we are today. And I thought it would be worthwhile beginning the, the panel discussion of asking, what is the current legal basis for the U.S. military presence in Syria, given that the Syrians certainly didn't invite us there? And um, some people question what the authority is. So maybe I'll start with you, Jen, from your perspective. Uh, what is the basis, the legal basis for the U.S. presence in Syria today? So thank you, and thank you for, for including me on this in this great discussion. So there's two questions when you ask about the legal basis. There's an international law question, and there's a domestic law question. Um, the domestic, so starting with the domestic law question, um, there's, as everybody knows, there's never been an explicit authorization to send troops um, to Syria. Um, and so the domestic law justification stems from um, a variety of different sources, including the fact that there's been appropriations to support these, these um, expenditures. Um, and at least um, initially when forces were kind of ramped up in, under the Obama administration, um, there was a justification that relied in part on the then uh, still existing um, 2002 authorization to use force um, against Iraq, which um, was based on the fact that, um, in part, there was a defense of the Iraqis. So it was a little bit of convoluted reasoning, but that justification was, was relied on um, as well. Um, the international law question, um, it's complicated. Um, it's certainly, um, there's not, um, it, it, whether or not, I mean, it certainly um, is 
the U.S. is in conflict with Syria in its actions. Um, it's not invited in. There's no consent. Um, and so, therefore, you get into a bunch of tough questions about what is the justification for, for doing so. Yeah, Jeremy or Charlie, any comment? Yeah, I, I agree with what, what Jen says. I'd just add a couple of footnotes in that when you're talking about in uh, ISIS, ISIS presented a threat to the United States in addition to a threat to Iraq. And so you had that overlay. I think there was also, uh, besides the 2002 AMF, the 2001 AMF was also raised because ISIS is considered, at least by, I think, both administrations, as a heir to al-Qaeda. And if you remember, the language in the 2001 AMF talked about uh, those who had perpetrated 9-11 and it eventually has been extended to associated forces uh, and so forth. So you have that, plus you have the president's Article II powers. Probably... And I'd like to hear what my colleagues have to say. I think one of the most controversial things in national security law these days is the precise scope of the president's Article II powers as commander in chief. We have a few cases, a steel seizure case that, that touches upon it, but it's not like Congress's Article I powers where you have an enumeration. It's just the commander in chief power. So you, you had that overlay. The international law Justification, I think Jen touched on it. Uh, one is defending Iraq. Uh, in other words, the idea of, uh, of uh, self-defense in of a, of, of Iraq, defense of Iraq. But also, I think you can make the argument that it's also defense of the United States. And so, well, how does that justify us being in Syria, uh, even if we are... Uh, battling ISIS, and it's this developing theory uh, that we see of uh, un unwilling or unable to, if Syria is unwilling or unable to stop ISIS from presenting a threat to the U.S. or U.S. interests, then that is seen as the justification for being in Syria. Uh, controversial, yes, uh, but I do think it's, it's the better view personally. Well, let me start with the domestic law issue. Um, yeah, uh, people just down the street there on the House side are issuing all these subpoenas. We want to see this. We want to see this. We want this person to testify and that person to testify. And the Trump White House is saying, no, never, no. OK, maybe. All right, let's talk about it. And one of the just interesting things about these disputes, can the president claim executive privilege? Or if he doesn't claim executive privilege, can he still say, my people are not coming? Can they say, no, we're going to punish you? Is how little case law there is. And there's hardly any case law, I think, because neither side really wants this to be very clear because they're afraid they'd lose something. And in the meantime, they still want to say indignantly, the law is on our side. Um, I'm not sure if we really need that to be quite as open as it is, but um, I think when it comes to deployment of force, let's just use the most general term, force, um, are there are good reasons why courts don't want to get into this, and there are good reasons why uh, we like to have this somewhat fluid, because it means over an extended period, um, there's an opportunity for people on either side, I don't just mean house or uh, Congress and executive, but people who are more cautious about deploying force and people who are more exuberant about deploying force, they have arguments to make and it's not going to be settled by parsing precedents. There's serious considerations on both sides, even legal considerations. I want to mention just one other thing in connection with the domestic issues. Um, as Matthew mentioned, this started with covert aid. The CIA was sending people. The likelihood is that whether we continue to have the small number of troops that we have now in Syria or not, the CIA will still be there. And I, I'm not sure it's a really important principle. Are they covert or are they overt? And by the way, they were covert in a way that was known to everyone. So I, even what you mean by covert there is a little strange. Um, we, I think it's been an ongoing policy. Certainly Obama started it. 
Um, so I think there are questions to be raised about this, but I don't think we're going to even try to settle it. That just on the domestic side. And I want to say briefly on the international side, huh, I think it's really the same thing. We want to say it's very wrong of Russia to have seized um, the Crimea from Ukraine. And it's very wrong of them to be in one way or another involved in Eastern Ukraine. So we want there to be a principle in international law that you can't just uh, exert force in someone else's sovereign territory. Yes. Uh, and then there are all these exceptions. And just to mention two of them, uh, there's the, we had to do this to protect our allies kind of argument. And then there's humanitarian intervention. Uh, what was exactly the rationale in Kosovo? What was the legal authorization? There the UN commissioned a report at the end of which uh, the report said uh, it was illegal but legitimate. Okay, that's good enough, I guess. I, I mean, international law, you're not going to get it likely before a court. And I think Syria is such a complicated, specialized situation that you shouldn't expect very clear lines. But to say this last thing, um, we have been um, arming, training, uh, supporting, encouraging the Kurds in northwest Syria. Um, if we just say, okay, we're out of here, goodbye, there really is a good chance that a lot of people, including a lot of civilians, will be slaughtered. So I think we really do have some humanitarian obligation there, as well as strategic interest. Uh, and our sometime allies in Iraq really want us to stay. I think a lot of people in the region want us to stay. So uh, let's just say it's, it's ambiguous. It's probably not in our interest to be too clear, but there are some considerations which have some resonance in international law. Jen, do you want to follow up? Yeah, just a, just a few things, um, just immediately following up on some of those comments and then going back to the 2001 AUMF as well. Um, so I think um, it's important, particularly when we're talking about national security and international law, to not think that law is not law just because it's not before court. Um, so much of law that matters is never heard before a court, but that doesn't mean it doesn't matter. Um, and um, whether whether lawyers in the government get it right all the time, that's a separate question. But there are a lot of lawyers working throughout the federal government who are aware, at least in the United States, not in all countries, but certainly in the United States, aware of the legal constraints and trying to build policies consistent with those constraints, whether one agrees with their decisions or not. So I just, I think law binds in lots of different ways. Courts is kind of the most obvious in your face one. And for law students, it's the most obvious one, but there's all kinds of other ways in which law binds as well. Um, and then on the, the domestic question, because I think, um, I, and I obviously should have mentioned the 2001 AUMF, which is a primary justification, domestic authorization for the actions in Syria. Um, I think it's worth just stepping back for a minute and thinking about what that authorization was. That was an authorization that was passed within a week after the 9-11 attacks, at a point in time in which the United States wasn't even sure who had attacked us. It's a 60-word authorization that author authorizes the president to use necessary and appropriate force against those he deems are responsible for the 9-11 attacks. Turns out, as we all know, that with the Taliban and Al Qaeda. And then over time, as, as Charlie mentioned, um, that was that interpretation of that authorization has been expanded by saying it's not just Taliban and Al Qaeda, it's also associated forces of Al Qaeda. Um, and, and then over time, and this was an Obama administration interpretation, the Obama administration says it's not just associated forces of Al Qaeda, it's successor forces of Al Qaeda to cover ISIS. ISIS didn't exist on 9-11. And so the United States is fighting a war, multiple wars, um, conflicts, certainly armed conflicts in various places around the world based on an authorization that was passed at this point, um, almost 18 years ago. And that, and so, so why do we care? I think we ought to care because um, first of all, it's, it's not the structure that, that our constitution sets up. Congress is supposed to be playing a, a role in declaring war. War powers are a shared power and they're a shared power 
for a reason. Obviously, the executive has an enormous amount of authority in terms of how a war is waged and with respect to defensive authorities as well. But the decision to send young men and women in to battle is a decision that our founding fathers understood ought to be made by the political branches of our country that are accountable to the public. And I think that that's an important message that's gotten lost over the last 18 years, partially because executives have been able to do what they want to do, partially because Congress doesn't want to step in and take hard votes. Um, but as we're thinking about Syria, as we look at the potential for conflict with Iran, as we think about what's going on in Venezuela, um, I think it's critically important that we insist as, as a public that Congress plays a role and steps up and, and asserts its views in the discussion, which is, at least in theory, supposed to represent our views. Yeah, I, I, I would really endorse that. I think technically, legally, the uh, 2001 AMF remains in force. And from a legal perspective, what the courts will probably tell you is A, they won't handle it because yeah. the political question doctrine varies what we call justiciability issues. But they'll also say, well, wait a second, Congress is keeps appropriating money. They know what this money is being used. Ergo, that's tantamount to their approval. But I think what Jen is talking about is really what the constitutional structure was intended to be. I, I have no doubt that if uh, the founding fathers were here, they, they wouldn't even be able to comprehend what we're doing. And if you need some historical background, there's a, some good books coming out on the, uh, like the Jefferson presidency, the wars in Tripoli and everything else. Are, and they're worth taking a look at because there was a, kind of a struggle between the executive and the legislative branch. But when you really get into it, uh, they ultimately understood it was a shared responsibility. So, and I do think that uh, we owe it to the men and women that we're sending in harm's way to make it very clear that uh, this is what the United States is expecting of you. But she's also right that uh, Congress, uh, I asked Adam Schiff a couple of years ago before, and you know what, and he said one of the greatest failures that, that Congress has had is that they haven't wrestled with this, with this issue. And that's not to say that he would not support, you know, battling ISIS. He just thinks that uh, Congress ought to wrestle with it. And I think that's very, very true. And so, uh, but there's no incentive for any congressman to, you know, wrestle with this because they could find themselves on the wrong side of history and they don't want to do that. And that's not even bringing in our hyperpartisan, you know, situation. It's very specific to these uses of force. If the, if the electorate isn't complaining about it, which they aren't really, then I think that it's just just going to go on until it doesn't. Uh, I, I just two quick things uh, to Jennifer's initial point. I, I have some sympathy for that. Like there is a law, and it's serious, and it means something, and it's real, and it doesn't depend on courts. Yes, kind of. Yes. I mean, we should take things seriously that are in the Constitution and not say the only thing that matters is what courts say. On the other hand, it's telling when courts say, oh, this is a political question. And what they mean by that is not that there's no law, but they don't want to be committed to determining exactly what that means and how it works. So they're acknowledging that. I mean, it's Justice Jackson who says when Congress hasn't authorized but hasn't prohibited, there's a twilight zone. <laughs> and that meant mm, we're not too clear about what that is. It's something. It's in the Constitution. So we should acknowledge that there can be ongoing ambiguities or there can just be differences of opinion. It happens all the time on the Supreme Court. Different justices have different doctrines and they don't give them up. And maybe none of them adds up to a majority or there is a temporary majority, but others say no, eventually it's going to change. So we should be more open to indeterminacy as just a factual um, matter that that's sometimes where we are, which I do think is here. And then quickly about Syria, we should add to all the other things that's been mentioned. It's very ambiguous what, as a practical matter, what we think they are doing there, because they're not at this point engaged in an ongoing armed conflict. They are helping someone else in a 
conflict, which is not even ongoing. It's episodic. So they're, they're somewhere in between conflict and deterrence. And if you say that it's really more deterrence, which I think quite a lot of the eagerness to have American troops there is to deter, well, then it starts to look like sending troops to the Baltic states, which, again, the Obama administration was saying, oh, yes, it would be a good thing to do. And maybe it's provocative. Maybe it's dangerous. We've had people now in Ukraine. Um, there is fighting nearby. I, I think it's just hard to resolve exactly what it is we're talking about and maybe wouldn't be helpful to commit to. This is the precise legal theory that covers it. In, in fairness to the courts, uh, the courts, when we should not want them to do this, yeah. to decide if force should be used in a given place, because they don't have institutional competence to do that. The courts don't have intelligence services. The courts don't have militaries. They don't have any experience in, in, in what can and can be done in that, that regard. So that's why they will say, you'll see in their decisions, that they don't have institutional competence. Uh, and in terms of, you know, uh, they always say international laws, it, it, the vanishing point of international law is the law, law of war. But I can tell you, and just to back up what, what Jen has said, uh, even though we don't have a lot of uh, actual court cases involving U.S. troops, uh, a lot of energy, enormous amount of energy is spent by the U.S. military to comply with international law on the use of force. Unbelievable amount of energy technology and everything else. And you, you heard the number of lawyers we have in the Air Force alone, over 2,000. And the other services have similar amounts. A lot of that energy is going just to comply with the law, even though we're not really expecting the ICC or the World you know, anything like that. So it does matter. It does control behavior of this country. Right. And one way, one place where the courts do get involved and have gotten involved is with respect to detention. So in the course of a conflict, when individuals are detained, there needs to be a legal justification for holding them. Um, and so this has come up most evidently with respect to the Guantanamo detainees. There's still some 40 detainees at Guantanamo, and the justification for their, their detention is the 2001 authorization to use military force. Um, and all of the detainees who are there are detained pursuant to their ties to Al Qaeda. So they're they're more squarely they are squarely covered within the authorization. Although there have been, and I would expect that there will continue to be over time, various challenges brought by some of the detainees saying that the relevant conflict with which we were detained no longer exists, that we're not in a conflict with Al-Qaeda. And so therefore, kind of the justification for our detention has unraveled. You can hold us pursuant to the specific conflict we were detained for. And now the conflict is, looks so different, is so different, that it's not the same conflict. And the justification cannot kind of go back to this 2001 AUMF. Um, it also um, could be forced um, if, in fact, the United States were ever to take into custody some an ISIS member or another um, member of an associated or loosely connected group, then the courts would be squarely required to assess whether or not um, the 2001 AUMF, which doesn't mention these groups, actually covers members of individuals associated with these associated or successor groups as well. And that um, is a potential forcing function to get Congress to engage. But again, um, it depends on courts agreeing either with the kind of unraveling of detention authority theory or um, the executive taking into, into its custody new detainees who then bring challenges. Yeah, but I think that is a good example of institutional competence because that issue was raised to the Supreme Court. I think it was Justice O'Connor. She said, uh, we know a little bit about detention. We've been doing that for 200 years. So, you know, in, in different contexts. So that, I think, is a classic example where there is institutional competence. I, I wanted to come back to the panel on the role of Congress in this. And so you were talking about the fact that uh, 
I, I think I'm here, maybe you didn't say it quite this way, Jen, and I, and I think Charlie, you expressed something similar. It'd be nice to see something more concrete out of Congress, either saying, yes, we approve this, no, we don't. Here are the new constraints or refinements around the 2001 AMF. I'm just wondering if, and I think I heard Charlie express uh, sort of concern about what the founders might think of all this in the state we're in. Um, but I'm also wondering if the current circumstance in Syria and what Congress has done, which is obviously continue to appropriate defense dollars for monies um, to flow into the Department of Defense to execute the mission in Syria, and obviously monies to the CIA to do the same. I'm wondering if we've reached a sort of functional equilibrium among the branches that says, yeah, you know, we, we are in favor of this. I mean, if we recall in 2013, there was an actual AUMF that was brought by the Obama administration to Congress to take uh, action in Syria. Uh, it was pulled back when the Obama administration felt there was a good likelihood that it wouldn't succeed in the House. And I think, you know, Joe Biden was counting votes in the Senate. Um, but it's not as if the House ever said, whoa, 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 wait a minute, what are you doing a couple of years later when the Obama administration clearly ramped up the engagement there? So I'm just wondering if maybe the concerns about whether Congress is actually engaging our, you know, I'm, I'm just challenging your thought that uh, maybe Congress isn't engaging. Maybe it has engaged to the level of where we are in the conflict. We don't have 100,000 men and women in a war in Syria. We have them doing, as Jeremy put it, something helping some people. Right. So I mean, you called it a functional equilibrium. I would call it, a. I think we are in an equilibrium, but I think it's a dysfunctional equilibrium. And I think that because, um, you know, so what the equilibrium basically is, or or what the the state of affairs is, it's 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 really Congress deferring kind of whole scale to the executive, um, and so the executive has over time, Bush administration, Obama administration, and now the Trump administration have kind of interpreted the AUMF in a kind of ever expanding way, in a way that Congress never could have intended when it passed it in two thousand and one. And what that does is it is it basically has been expanded in ways that more or less allow the president to do what the president wants to do in a way that aggrandizes executive power and and basically um, delegates to the president all of the decisions about uses of force, not just the execution of the war, but when and where to send troops or drones or um, or a range of different actors, and so. I think that's, I mean, even if there is a kind of quiet acquiescence through appropriations, I think that that is unfortunate. And I think it's potentially dangerous long term because the consequences are and can be so significant. And we ought to insist that the political branches that are accountable in a more direct way are part of that discussion and that debate, even if it forces Congress members into uncomfortable and difficult votes. That's their job. And it's it's unfortunate that we've gotten to the situation where that's not happening. Now, I do think that there's some lessons to be learned here so that if and when and the authorization to use military force of 2001 is either repealed and replaced or there's a determination that, in fact, this conflict is so different that we need a new authorization, um, there ought to be a sunset provision to force that. Um, and, and then there's a whole set of other considerations about what that authorization should look like, including some sort of parameters on, on the associated force definition as well, if that's part of the authorization. Well, sure. I, I, I think, I was just going to say, I think Jeremy and, and Jen have made a really good point. There is this, this level of, of acquiescence. Uh, and I think Congress is comfortable, and I think the public is comfortable. They know things are going on. But as Jen alluded to, we live in a world, Thomas Friedman wrote that because of technological change, we're rapidly entering, entering an era where one person can kill all of us. And that's why we have to be paying attention. That's why we have to bring to bear the collective wisdom of our elected leadership on the legislative side and not just depend on the on the executive side. And that's not even to be critical of the executives. It's just that these problems are so complex, like everything else, if we can bring more 
brain power to it and more of a diversity of views, we're going to get a better decision. And in any event, I think the, the public discussion would be helpful to let the electorate know what's going on and why this is important. It's good to have discussion up to a point, but um, I, I find it really hard to envision, particularly now with the House and the Senate in the hands of different parties, that they're going to come to an agreement that is detailed enough, clear enough, that it actually is constraining, but is not demagogic and irresponsible. I mean, we, we are basically, as you said, at a point where we think uh, it's okay to have some involvement as long as we're not taking a lot of casualties. Now, that's in a way selfish, self-regarding, but there are, that's, of course, every country thinks more about its own uh, people and its own troops. It, it's not optimal. I don't mean to say there's no other issue, but I think there is an understanding that um, the president does not at all have a blank check. He couldn't just say, you know what, let's send 50,000 troops there and really just tidy this thing up. Right? He could, it, 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 it couldn't even be proposed. It couldn't even be discussed, I don't think. He understands that what, what he, he's on a leash, which gives him quite a lot of discretion, but they're really, you know, he will run out of leash if he makes this into a commitment that involves real costs to us, particularly casualties. So I, I'm not defending it as, oh, it's great. It's unfortunate. But I think it is not realistic to think there are good alternatives. If we just hector Congress enough, they will work it out and figure this out. I think that's uh, unlikely. And, and, and let me uh, change gears just a little bit. So in the, in sort of my intro, I talked about sort of the, the run-up. First, there was CIA activity. Yeah. Uh, then there was surveillance, then there was airstrikes, then there were regular soldiers on the ground in the thousands. And I'm wondering if the panel has a view, and I'm sorry, I should have said to the audience, uh, we'll save a little time at the end for questions from the audience. So if you've got um, questions in your head, you'll get an opportunity to ask a few. Um, but as we think about that sort of continuum of engagement, um, is the legal authority for those different things different? Is it constant from the beginning or is the authority that I, is the, if I was the president of the United States, is the authority I need to send CIA operators there to assist with my national security goal in Syria different than the authority I need to bomb? And is it different than the authority I need to send, you know, a brigade there to do, to engage in combat? I, I just want to start on this. It's a great question and remind people that Apart from our having a standing presence there in the Kurdish region, we've several times under both Obama and uh, President Trump, uh, we've had airstrikes, at which we claimed were in, I'm not saying it was not true, but this was our official rationale. Uh, you used poison gas, we're going to punish you. And I, I'm sorry, I, using poison gas. Well, how's that authorized by Article 2? How's that authorized by the authorization for the use of military force? I mean, that was just out there on its own. But the international community seemed to be like, oh, yeah, OK, yeah. And there wasn't much complaint about it in Congress. Now, we can go a step up from uh, use of poison gas to slaughtering a lot of civilians, which is a real prospect if we don't stay to protect people in the Kurdish region. What are we gonna do if they're slaughtering a lot of people? And my guess is at the very least, we'd do some airstrikes. If you wanna do airstrikes, you gotta know where you're aiming. If you wanna aim, you gotta have people who can advise you, who are they? The best ones are Americans. The second best are people coached by Americans reporting to Americans. So if you want to preserve the capacity, even to just do this episodic kind of intervention from a distance with airstrikes, you probably wanna have some presence there. That's not the same as having troops, but it's on a continuum with having a small number of troops in a... And I don't think there are easy places to say, oh, now you've crossed a line and it's a different thing. Previously, it was a covert operation. Now it's a prelude to war. Now it's gone from prelude and crossed another line to actual armed conflict. I think that this is all... It's all on a continuum. It's all not very clear. Yes, law is serious, and we shouldn't just say, oh, never mind, but we should also acknowledge that there are situations where you're not likely to get agreement on what, exactly how to define the relevant criteria, and probably the most you can ask for is that everybody is careful. That's a Je lesson to some 
Jen or Charlie, any thoughts on that sort of the... Well, in terms of the legal architecture, there is different laws associated with covert action. But in terms of the international law regarding the use of force, there won't be any difference between an airstrike and and troops in the ground except by degree and, mm-hmm. and, and gravity. I think that um, uh, depends on, on what you want to do, whether you need to have people on the ground. I think the, the strikes for again, because of the uh, chemical weapons were kind of sui generis in that you're talking about something that is universally condemned by the world community. It's a very unique circumstance. We had U.S. troops in the area. The U.S. troops had been attacked by Syrian proxy forces less than a few weeks before. So there there were different considerations. I, I, I don't know that the strikes... Uh, and it was supported by the, the world community, as Jeremy pointed out. I don't think that they are much of a president beyond when you have a very unique weapon of mass destruction that is universally condemned, uh, as opposed to other kinds of situations. Yeah, I mean, so I, I I agree with that. There's there's obviously different authorities for for covert and, and overt actions, but. And and some some set of actions don't rise to the level that require either a domestic law authorization or they don't rise under international law. The question is, are we talking about a use of force? So there's a bunch of the descriptions of the lead up that were not did not rise to that level. So we're talking about a different set of international law considerations than use of force considerations. Um, on the on the airstrikes, um, I mean, I I do think it's it's you know. Was is hard to to find a solid um, justification under existing international law categories. Um, the Trump administration relied on a combination of um, defensive troops um, and a humanitarian justification. Um, there is, I think, a question about whether um, a humanitarian justification over time becomes a is deemed by the international community a legitimate um, international law justification for using force in another sovereign's territory without their consent but we're not there yet um, and so this you know international law develops in a lot of different ways one is by treaty another is by customary international law which is a combination of state practice and what states say about that practice um, so to the extent we're moving towards a kind of new customary international law norm um, here we've got a couple a few different examples where humanitarian interventions um, have been justified and or implicitly or explicitly accepted by the international community and that may be a norm we're moving towards. And I, I would, to the extent we are moving towards a norm, and I think we may be, I would read it very narrow, narrow, you know the word I'm struggling with, uh, nuclear, biological, chemical, things like that, but just a general humanitarian intervention. I don't think we're there that yet, notwithstanding, as Jeremy pointed out, the Kosovo. Uh, and I don't think we want to get there. Because one person's humanitarian intervention is somebody else's invasion, so uh, that that would that would not be a good thing. I mean, just as a thought experiment, if we're thinking about uh, military intervention based on humanitarian crisis, if there was an alignment of countries of with uh, large Muslim populations and they wanted to intervene in what China is doing with the Uyghurs. Uh, it would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't advise that. I, I'm not saying that. it's advisable, but I'm just wondering under the precedent that is or is not being set in Syria, is there an argument that can be made that? I don't think so. I mean, so the, I mean, the, the thing about use of force in other countries is that we have a treaty. We have the UN Charter. Right. And so the UN Charter sets very explicit limits on the use of force in another country. Um, and it's basically either self-defense collective self-defense or with a UN Security Council authorization. So potentially you could imagine the UN Security Council coming together and authorizing the use of force in that situation. Assuming that China diplomat is- And not going to happen. And there's a whole, including, there's a whole lot of geopolitical reasons that would never happen. But I do think that, I mean, a lot of the kind of repression of the Uyghur community is through technology and through like 
mm-hmm. the con- technological control, and that relates to a point that Charlie made earlier about how so much so much of the hostilities that we're talking about is not about ground troops, um, and I think the law has not caught up to that because there is this assumption, it's um, very clear when you look at um, executive branch reporting to Congress under the War Powers Act, which we haven't talked about yet, which requires um, congressional, according to Congress, there's a debate about whether or not it's constitutional, but according to Congress, um, requires um, congressional authorization for, um, for, for engagement in hostilities. And um, recent, reports and justifications to Congress have basically relied to significant fact on boots being on the ground as triggering this definition of hostilities. But if you think about conflict and the possibility to really wreak a lot of havoc and also potentially provide justifications for other nations or other bad actors wreaking havoc on us, a lot of that, most of that is not going to happen going forward with boots on the ground. It's going to happen with a combination of strikes that don't require any boots and and more um, discreetly through a whole set of cyber means as well. I, I want to say something about Syria being a special case. I, I agree that we should be real cautious about saying, oh, if you have a good motive, you can intervene wherever you want to. If you're helping people, it's okay. That's, that's not okay. We, we want to, to have a very strong norm against intervening in other countries. Yes. I mean, for the world, we want that. The Syria case really is a very special case. So if you think that chemical weapons are special, I'm not exactly sure where that came from or whether it's well-based, but the world seemed to accept it. Well, that's the place where they've been used repeatedly by the same regime that we're trying to contain. Uh, it's not, well, we just jumped into a otherwise into, there's five other countries in there, right? The Turks are there, the Russians, the Iranians, the Iraqis. So it's already a kind of internationalized conflict. It's not just intervening in someone else's domestic affairs. And uh, even the particular thing that we're doing now, which is trying to protect or at least reassure um, the Kurdish region there in, in the Northwest, the Syrian government in Damascus is not saying these are rebels and we will crush them. That is not what they're saying. They, they are acknowledging that there's some, it has some status different from other places where they just want to crush them. Um, now, that's not exactly international law. It doesn't say that Syrian sovereignty doesn't, as a legal matter, in some sense apply. But there is something special about that whole situation. And I, I think international law has got to be I'm not saying it's not law, but it's got to be flexible enough to accommodate special circumstances. Uh, corpus separatum. Maybe there needs to be special law for just Syria because it's so, so messy. And it's also extremely important because it borders on all these other places where you have to worry about triggering a war. So um, I think just we should be real, real cautious about this, both in claiming too much for it is a precedent, and on the other side, thinking that, oh yeah, well, we have the rules that so we can just like impose them. It's sad, difficult, but um, I don't think we're gonna improve it by saying there are simple rules that, that cover it. And, and, and given that uh, Jen just alluded to the War Powers Act and we were about three quarters of the way through our talk on authorities, um, I wanted to ask sort of a lightning round question to the panel. And that is, before we go to audience questions, is the War Powers Act functionally dead? I don't think so. I'm sorry, I, mean, I think it's important to, to, to when we, it makes sense that we didn't talk about it when we talk about authorities, because it's not an authority. It's basically Congress saying, hey, don't f- forget about us um, uh, if you're going to commit troops to new hostilities. Now it's it's been avoided because as we talked about already over and over again, the AUMF is all the all of the actions have been defined as encompassed within an authority that Congress gave the president, so that he doesn't need to go back and get a new set of authorities. But it does. I think it it still provides. Um, you know, the re- there's the reporting requirements, and those have been consistently mm-hmm. complied with. Um, every since the War Powers Act was enacted, every single president has declared that it's an unconstitutional restriction on 
his power. Um, at the same time, every single president has complied with all of the reporting requirements that um, that are engaged, that, that are required by the War Powers Act, and to the extent, which happened with the Libyan airstrike, uh, the, the Libyan no-fly zone um, under Obama, to the extent that um, there's been engagements beyond the 60 or 90 day clock um, administrations have at least attempted to comply with it by saying what they were doing was not hostilities and therefore not triggered by the clock, sometimes in, in kind of somewhat tortured ways. But there has been at least a recognition that they need to comply with it, otherwise they wouldn't bother to come up with the somewhat tortured legal reasoning to say that they were complying with it. Well, I think that um, if you think the War Powers Act or resolution as something that's going to stop something dead in their tracks, I, I don't think that's going to happen. It won't have that kind of effect. At the same time, uh, as Jen pointed out, every president has reported, quote, consistent with, as opposed to in compliance with, uh, the War Powers Resolution. So there, there's a value to that. And uh, so I would say there's a value to the War Powers Resolution. I think it has serious constitutional issues. Uh, and it's not exactly going to function as maybe they thought it would. But uh, I would not be in favor of just abandoning it because at least it, it does have kind of a forcing function, um, at least to have a little bit of the dialogue. I think the Constitution is serious, and Jen should say whether it is or is not valid law under the Constitution. <laughs> Depends on what part that you're talking about. Certainly the reporting requirement. Yeah. That's constitutional. We, we, we are living with it as a kind of, you know, it's floating out there. It's something. I totally agree. It's not actually very constraining. It may have some uh, useful inhibiting influence, and maybe that's good, or forces the president or the White House to think about how would we explain this, like what we're doing and making a statement already is making it a little harder to disregard it later. But I think it's a very good example of something that has this strange half-life of it isn't quite a law. It's certainly not going to be enforced by courts. I don't think it's going to be enforced by Congress. So it doesn't operate in quite the way we think laws should operate, but maybe it has some influence, and so we don't have to sneer at it. If there are any questions from the audience, we've got a few minutes left. Yes, uh, the gentleman all the way in the back. I see a, I see a hand up. Yep. Sir? So I'm, I, I'm, I'm glad you're asking this question because the next panel will talk about the policy issues and the results. So are there any other questions that are more maybe on the legal side? Sir, uh, the person in the dark short here in the second row. Well, I can't get in the minds of, of what the administration, but officially it's to defeat ISIS. The 74 nation coalition, if you look at what their mission statement, it is to defeat ISIS because that's perceived as a worldwide threat. 
And I do think that is the primer, primary mover of the whole involvement in Syria, because especially this president, I had, think, had no interest in, in you know, getting involved in the Middle East unless he had to. And I think that this was a situation that he inherited. I think the Obama administration was correct in what they did. Um, and I, as to what the end result has been, uh, ISIS has been crushed. Not completely, and you'll never crush an ideology, but in terms of what have we gotten out of it, we haven't had another 9-11 in, in 18 years. So uh, we paid a terrible price. Other people paid a terrible price. But at the end of the day, that was the mission. And I think uh, so far, it's been successful. Whether it's been done the, the best way, I think that's, that's a debate that we need to have. I just want to say th these things are hard to separate because if you go back a dozen years to the beginning of the, the civil war in Syria and people were saying, well, uh, the Assad regime is so brutal and tyrannical that, uh, of course, there's, there's an uprising and, of course, the Muslim Brotherhood and other groups are kind of rushing in there to lead this opposition. And then it came to be uh, ISIS. Uh, and people have been saying all along um, there needs to be a different kind of regime in Syria because otherwise that will encourage ISIS to come back. I mean, it's an anti-Sunni regime now. It's perceived that way by the Sunni majority. So you'd like it to be a more, if not democratic, at least uh, somewhat more open. I mean, you, you, you could imagine situations in Syria in which uh, ISIS would have less opportunity to mobilize opposition. So it is connected to this concern about ISIS. I don't myself feel any confidence that, oh, yeah, yeah, we could just do this, this, and this, and then it'll be fine. It's it's understandable that President Trump keeps saying, you know, we're not, we shouldn't be doing a nation building. We shouldn't be doing democracy building. I get it. He's wary for good reasons that you'll be drawn into something that's endless and difficult like Afghanistan. But still, I think it's true that it's a somewhat artificial distinction to say, or on the one hand, we're just trying to stop ISIS from coming back, or are we, on the other hand, trying to influence the Assad regime? I think those things are connected, and inescapably, if we're there, we're doing both. We would particularly like Assad not to be a wholly owned subsidiary of Iran, and we think that is also relevant to keeping down ISIS. So these things are connected. We've got time for one more. The gentleman here on the aisle. Uh, I'll let my colleagues uh, correct me on this, but we're not an occupying power in Syria. Ergo, unless they're actually in our, uh, in terms of legal responsibility, unless they're actually in our custody, then it's not our legal responsibility. We might have a moral and political responsibility, but not a legal responsibility. We are not an occupying power in that context. So um, and that's, I don't know if that's the reason we haven't taken any into custody, but I think if we took onesies or twosies today, they'd wind up in the Southern District of New York, or they would not wind up at Guantanamo, despite all the fire, you know, rhetoric you hear. At the same time, if somehow we, it would be, we'd have to start making up the answer if somehow we can't. Our troops, there's like 200, you know, which is not an inconceivable scenario. You know, if they walked into one of our compounds and threw their hands up, uh, that would be a hard problem to deal with. I, and I, and I mean, I agree on the on the assumption that we would take them into federal court partially or significantly because of this problem that it's not obvious that the courts would uphold, uphold their detention if we tried to detain them pursuant to the laws of war mm -hmm. because it's not clear that the authorization to use military force actually authorizes this conflict and therefore the detention. 
This is why we have Kurdish allies and we give them a lot of advice. I think on that note, I'm afraid that's all the time we have. Please join me in thanking the panel. Thank you.